more and more people of all ages are turning to biking, walking, running, and working out at the gym in an effort to live healthier, longer lives. As a result, we now have this middle-aged population with a lot of wear and tear on their bodies who are now finding it necessary to have joint replacement surgeries earlier in life. Access Health caught up with hip and knee specialist Dr. Jimmy Chow to learn about one of the latest surgical approaches helping to put the skip back in our step. My name's Chris Appleton, I'm 42 years old, and uh, my hip actually started hurting about two and a half years ago. I went to college at Pittsburgh State, played college football, won a national championship, probably part of the reason why I needed new hips. My name is Carol Alice, I'm 56 years old. Probably about six years ago, I noticed um, just a decrease in mobility. Two years ago, it just progressively got worse. My walking was diminishing, my ability to get up and down off the floor, and then traveling for work really became more complicated. We know that over the past decade, uh, the need for joint replacement in the United States has more than doubled. And so we're treating younger patients earlier with, uh, with uh, arthritis in their hips uh, so that they don't have to live the rest of their life with arthritis in their hips until they get, quote, old enough. A lot of pain, discomfort, difficulty sleeping, um, could not stand for long periods of time, couldn't sit for long periods of time, couldn't walk. It was very uncomfortable, very debilitating. Everyday things that people, I took for granted, people take for granted, um, tying your shoes, putting on your socks, clipping your toenails, bending down and having to go to the bottom shelf at the grocery store, getting in and out of cars, climbing two steps, um, even getting off a plane for me was one of the most horrible feelings in the world because you have, typically you get off a plane and I fly an awful lot every week and you get off the plane and you have to go up the up ramp and it was the hardest thing for me to do was to go up that up ramp. They would take me holding onto the railing and pulling myself up. If you think about what pain is, a subjective form of pain, um, pain measurement is probably the most accurate because it's really how you feel that matters. You have patients where the arthritis is so horrible, it's kind of like chewing on a, on a, on a very bad cavity for a long period of time. You think it's your sciatic nerve, you're getting older. Um, it's that curve of 45 to 50 that we all get. Originally diagnosed as lack of flexibility in my hip, and then it was diagnosed as a sciatic nerve problem. You know, I tried the chiropractor, I tried physical therapy, I tried injections. They were all very short-lived. Oftentimes physical therapy, swimming, created more pain at the end of the day than it did um, actually relieving it. My primary care doctor did the x-ray, noticed that the x-ray had some deformity, and he referred me to Dr. Chow. And then Dr. Chow diagnosed that I needed a new hip. So I had 0% cartilage in my left hip and 25 to 30% cartilage in my right hip. And uh, my specialist recommended that at that point I start looking at surgical options. Uh, I, I definitely wanted to seek the, the best surgeon and try to understand the various uh, procedures that are out there. The first time that a, a patient gets offered a hip replacement, their answer is often, no, I'm not ready for that. It's, a, it's kind of a hard pill to swallow. It is considered major orthopedic surgery. But once you get over that initial shock, and you start talking to other surgeons and you're starting to get a consensus about what's going on around your hip, then it's much easier to, um, uh, easier to digest in terms of that. Most of the surgical approaches in hip replacement are options that involve some kind of trauma to the surrounding muscles and tissues. This can lead to long recovery periods as well as missed time at work. I'm only in my you know, mid-50s and um, still wanted to travel and do everything I had been doing. And so that's when I made my final decision to use Dr. Chow's new procedure. Now, hip replacement surgery historically removes the ball of the hip. That's why it's called hip replacement. So the ball of the hip is what's diseased. and It becomes kind of flattened or misshapen, and it kind of grinds on the hip. And so we replace that ball, and we put a liner in the socket to protect the pelvis. One of the earliest ways to do hip surgery, we're all based on keeping the hip in kind of a straight position. And by flexing the hip into more of a fetal position, all of your muscles become relaxed. The main structures that we cut are going to be skin, then fat. Uh, our average was six and eight centimeters. And then we split the muscle without cutting the muscle. So I actually use my finger to split it. We're actually using the normal spaces between muscles. And so we're actually placing retractors into positions in between the muscles. We expose the envelope of the hip. We make an inline incision, which is just a straight line, and open it up like that. 
and then that capsule becomes a reverse tent for our entire procedure. We're not ripping anything around. We're not putting stress on the hip that we can, that we can avoid. We're really trying to be very gentle with everything. Superpath is a, is a convertible surgery. It's a surgery that starts off as superpath, but you can easily convert it to the workhorse incision that you're used to. And worst case scenario, you don't get superpath, you get a traditional hip replacement. Contrary to traditional surgery where you cut everything and then you know, oh, it's gonna take you about three months or two months to heal that, that part of it. We're not doing that. So what I tell my patients, and this is what I see as an average in my office, most of our patients are up and walking within, um, within hours of the surgery. Um, uh, but the nice thing about this is that it, it, it puts the healing process back into the hands of the patient because they're no longer sitting in bed with a bell in their hand on them in order to get them to heal enough that they can go and, uh, say, put on their own clothes or shower themselves or make themselves a sandwich. They should be able to do that pretty much right away after the surgery. I went into surgery December 10th and, um, of 2014. Within three hours of being in my room, I was up and walking on my new hip. I literally woke up and they got me up and I was walking down the hall and I was home the next day and I was back to work in 13 days. Um, the day after surgery, I walked a mile uh, on both hips. So after both surgeries, the day after, and it's encouraged that you'd get that activity going as soon as possible. And I was able to walk up and down steps the day after surgery. What we've discovered is that most of the problems that patients experience after a superpath hip replacement don't necessarily come from the surgery. They actually come from the immediate change in their activity level. So they go from basically not doing much to all of a sudden being able to do quite a bit and they can move quite a bit better too. So we know that the hip replacement is going to work fine, but now what we want to do is we want to prepare that patient for their new onset activity level. And that's what almost all of the physical therapy is based on. It's quite exciting. I have done um, workouts. I have done some light jogging, fast walking in the last nine months. And I've done a lot of swimming this summer and absolutely pain-free. It's, it's been a godsend for me. I'm, the surgery enabled me to get back to a lifestyle that someone at 42 years old that really is healthy everywhere else should lead.